Is this just on Facebook? <laughs> yeah, then I post it on Fridays to uh, YouTube. But I, I, ha I know there's a way I can do it, but... Oh, Aiden, how you doing? I'm sure Natalia, when you call my finger cracks and disgusting. Oh, yeah. She thought that was so funny. Ah, and I was like, my wife would... I'd like crack it all. She likes to crack her toes, and she does that. She cracks her toes. <laughs> she cracks her toes? Yeah. Wow. All right, let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Christ from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the twos, bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, bestowing life. Christ is risen. <laughs> so we're now on the second of the four ships. Remember, we had last week we had discipleship. This week we're doing apostleship. Next week we're going to do fellowship. Then we'll do stewardship. And then I'm going to add one more class in because you, and because I, I realized I never did the salvation class on about salvation, like how are we saved? So we have. Yeah, we can get into that. Yeah, actually it does. The class does have. So you, this multimedia extravaganza that we have, right? Is it just a PowerPoint? I'm sorry if I built it up too much. This is part of a presentation that I've done all over the world and I this is also part of the stuff I teach at seminary so we're going to do part of it today um, because when we talk about apostleship it will lead to fellowship all right because as this word here I invented this um, Kanaic evangelism in other words the, how is the community evangelized so we, and, and basic principle that we're going to talk about is evangelism require or apostleship requires um, individual actions, but it's a community effort. And we're, you'll see how this comes through. But we're going to talk about the individual part of this today. And this is something I've been developing for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. And years. So um, just before we get going, someone had asked me why I don't like that word mission, right? And, 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 and that's really because it's a 17th century term that came into um, use in the, particularly during the Protestant Reformation and it came this idea of sort of this mission like we're going to go out and save all the heathens sort of thing and so this idea of mission always to me struck me as kind of and believe me I'm not like this but it does strike me uh, that a bit like kind of triumphalistic in a way. Actually, I wrote a paper with a, uh, a Protestant professor called Not So Far West, which talks about how, why we got to get rid of some of these terms because they have very different connotations in the Orthodox world as they do in the Western world and even within the Western world. And then the term evangelism, evangelios, to bring the good news, is a good term. And again, it wasn't one that was necessarily used until much later in the church. And now it's become sort of this um, term that is so used by Protestants that when you mention, particularly to Orthodox who became, people who were Protestant and became Orthodox, and you mention evangelism, they get a visceral reaction. Like, it, it, it really, it, it's just like, I don't like that term. I just, it, it just smacks to me like I got to go out and tell people, ask people if they're saved. And so I get that. The term the church has traditionally used is apostleship. And so that's why, I, I, you know, I mean, this was done for a particular reason why I'm using these terms, but this idea of apostleship, that apostolos, to be sent out, right? The apostles were sent out. And there's a whole, if you remember from the saints class, there's a whole category of saints. You're not going to see much of me here unless I stand way back here. Um, there's a whole category of saints who are apostles, right? Not just the 12 apostles, but remember there's apostle to America, apostle to Georgia, apostle to the apostles, Mary Magdalene. So there's a, there, there is a, a ch deep church history to that. It's something I'm, I'm still working on and developing and I want to expand on. But I want to move into this. So that's Father Alexander Schmemann. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. 
So this was a quote from, from him, and it's one I like to, to open up. I hope you can see that at home. Can a church whose life is centered almost exclusively on liturgy, whose sacraments, whose spirituality is primarily mystical and ascetical, be truly missionary? In other words, can the Orthodox Church be a missionary church? Can it be an apostle, apostolic church in that sense, being sent out? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> not only, <laughs> yeah, that was an easy one. That's a, that's, that's a softball. You know, not only can it be apostolic, come sit closer with all of us. Don't sit by yourself. Move the chairs around. Um, it has to, not only is it, and historically it has been, but it must be. We have to be a missionary church. We have to constantly be reaching out. From the very beginning, if you trace the history from Apostle Paul to, you know, you go through all those missions and all those apostles who went throughout the world and spread the Orthodox Church, right? I mean, even up into, into America, to, you know, St. Herman up into Alaska and others who actually pass through this area. We always are out there planting churches. We just don't do it necessarily in the same way that the Western Church does it. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. So it's incredibly important that we answer this question consistently because, by the way, the liturgy is a missionary act. Right? It's, it's the ultimate. It's for us. It's our ultimate act of, of who, not only saying who we are, but also reaching out and spreading the gospel. You know, we draw people into the liturgy, which means work, if you remember, so that we can then send them out. So they can then draw people in. So they can then be sent out. So our greatest act, which seems very weird to like the West and the Protestant world, is that we say our greatest act is not me talking to you about are you saved? You know, do you believe in Jesus? It's that liturgy that we do. That liturgical act. Just think of, we all went through Holy Week. Just think of how powerful a message we did during Holy Week. And how important it was that all those services kind of brought context to everything. And then all the readings that happen after Pascha are all in some way about us going out and evangelizing, bringing the good news every Sunday. Just keep that in mind when you hear that. So this word kononia, I'm not going to go too far next because we're going to talk more about it next week. So that word kononia means... Uh, in a very weak form, fellowship. In an orthodox form, it means the Eucharistic fellowship. How do we know that? <coughs> Let's look at that quote. Go ahead. Uh, we, yeah. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to the communion. Katonum. Koinonia. That's the actual word in Greek that's used there. Koinonia. 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 Yeah, that's close enough. <laughs> to the breaking of bread and to prayer. All the Stop right there. Isn't that really important right there? And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the communion, the kononia, and the breaking of their bread and the prayer. Didn't I just say that about the liturgy? That's so incredibly important. Go ahead. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. That's our apostleship right there. Okay? Now if we go back. So we look at that and we say, oh yeah, the common understanding is that, oh, you know, Understanding evangelism is working with individuals to lead them to the faith and then present them to teachings, you know, like we're doing with Orthodoxy 101. But I would say to you, you know, teaching and preaching, all that, that's only that much of it. It's just as important to bring people in, but how do we keep people in? How are we always being apostles to people who are in the community who want to be part of the community? How are, we, how are we always preaching that good and, and living the gospel? 
which is more powerful than any words that we can say. To live as a good Christian. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And, by the way, and this is the critical one, why I keep watching all my new we receive people very closely. <coughs> and I will not receive anybody into the church until I feel that they've integrated into the community well enough. That I know that they've made relationships and they've had, you know, and they've done all that. Because that is just as critical as me putting chrism on you. And it all happened because of my first person I ever chrismated. Alright, so I was in Montana, a young priest of zeal. I'm going to go and build this church and I'm going to get, I got my first catechumen and he was well read. He even had a copy of the Philokalia in his, in his house and I thought this was going to be easy. Did all the training, gave him the classes, did all that stuff, chrismated him, never saw him again. Never saw him again. Actually, no, the last day of my service in Montana, he did come by. So I, that's why I got scared. Like, what the hell am I doing here? Like, if I'm going to be serious about this and bring people in and really start to understand how we're bringing people in and how we're integrating them, I had to really understand it. And that started my whole study, which eventually led to my doctorate uh, in this area because I, I really started to seriously think about it. And I think that that was the missing element. He never integrated into the community. Why didn't he come back? He was a goofball. <laughs> he had a lot of interesting stories, shall we say. Huh. Anyway, the other thing, and this is an important one, one I constantly remind my seminarians. <clears throat> Mary Lynn, can you read that? No, can, can you? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm struggling through my, my glasses here. Corinthians 3, 6. Yeah. One Corinthians. I have planted Apollo's Water, but God gave the increase. Yeah. That's an important <coughs> line. It's not me. It's God. What is, what is Apollos? Apollos is one of the... One of the um, so in, in Corinth, Paul had started the church. But then he left Apollos. Not okay. Apollo. Like, Corinth is right. a place. Corinth is a place, yes. Okay. And they're still paying the next, as I understand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and he started so, so Paul came and started the church there but he left a successor Apollos to lead the community right but what he said is I may have planted and Apollos watered but it's really about God God gives the increase right and I think we have to think about that. All of us in our individual ways all have different talents and gifts and skills and, and, and charismas that are given to us by God. But ultimately, we're just part of the puzzle of which only God is the, is the true thing. Again, if we're not leading people to Christ, then we're not doing our job. If we're trying to make people orthodox, we're not doing our job. We're trying to make people Christians. Followers of Christ, disciples, like we talked about last week. Now we believe in the orthodoxy is the way to understand Christ. But nonetheless, that's the key point. And so whatever I do, and then I leave, and the next person will come, and they'll do their thing, and the next person will come, and they'll do their thing. It's all up to us to make sure that we're relying on God for the increase. Yes? You know, it might be a stupid question. Probably. No, it's not. Um, they say God already knows what we're going to do. He chooses our paths. Right. Here, I just can't help to think that he doesn't choose more of us to come in this way. It's ineffable. I, That's yeah. I, I don't, you know. It's yeah. But, question. you know, God, he knows what we're going to do, but he doesn't force us to do it. Okay. Because it has to be free. Right. He doesn't want robots. Okay. Right. So you don't want you know like you will become orthodox. Mm, okay. you know? <laughs> no, he wants you to freely choose that. Now he knows what the choice is going to be. Foreknowledge isn't. Um, what, what's the saying? Foreknowledge is uh, isn't forcing you. He knows what the answer is, but you have to come to that. Right? Does that make sense? That's a, that's a very good question, actually. Thank you. So it's not a stupid question. All right. 
This is Archbishop Anastasios of Albania, one of, I think, the greatest <coughs> missionary, modern missionary uh, Orthodox. Um, and if you read his life and his story, and his work in Africa and his work resurrecting the church in Albania, remarkable. I, I had the privilege of serving with him in Tirana, at the, at the cathedral, and um, I've never experienced a liturgy like that. Like you knew you were serving with someone who's going to be a saint. And you just knew it. He, he just exuded it, the, the calmness, the peacefulness. And it's just a remarkable experience. So uh, one of his books, um, M Mission in Christ's Way, is required reading from all my students. What is it called? Mission in Christ's Way. So our personal Christian experience is made steadfast and strengthened through our incorporation into the mystical body of Christ. So again, all the stuff that we're going to talk about, all the stuff that, you know, our personal experiences, our personal way, how we preach the gospel is meaningless unless you're in a community. We all go to he heaven together but hell alone. And, and again, it's impossible to be a Christian by yourself. You cannot be a Christian by yourself. You have to have a community. You have to have an ecclesia, a gathering. Right? So when people say, oh, I follow my own thing, yeah, that's not, that's why we have 15,000. Father Schmemann again. The church thus is not a self-centered community, but precisely a missionary community whose purpose is salvation from, not salvation from, but of the world. Think about that. It's not about salvation from the world. It's salvation of the world. When we do that liturgy upstairs... <clears throat> I pray for the entire world. We all pray for the entire world. And I would even go so far as to say that what we do there every Sunday, every time we serve a service, affects the world, whether we know it or not. This little community here in Wappinger Falls affects the world. And God knew that and took it into account before the creation of the world. Because we all go out into the world. Right. We people have to live in the world. Who we are, even if we don't tell them, right. they still see it. Exactly. Now, some people are called to, be, to withdraw from the world, monks and nuns, you know, stuff like that. And that's their gift. And they pray for the world, by the way. They don't withdraw from the world. But their job is to pray for the world. In fact, there's a kind of a superstition sort of thing that when there are no more monks or nuns, the world ends. I was just about to say, I heard a saint say that yeah. when there's no monasticism and there's no liturgy, the world will end. Yeah, so, but think of, think of how profound, I mean, when you think of the liturgy in that term, how much more important it is for you to be at the liturgy, to participate in the liturgy, to offer your prayers in the liturgy, it becomes incredibly important for the world, for the world. So, the Orthodox experience and faith in the church sacrament that makes it possible the church mission. So by being fed by what we're being fed there allows us then to go out into the world. That's my church in Montana, by the way. Oh, look at you. Yeah, young. <laughs> young. Yeah. So that, that iconostas was actually Natalie Wood was married in front of that iconostas and Rachmaninoff was buried in front of it. It, was, it used to be in the cathedral. It was made for a movie in the cathedral in Los Angeles, which was set as a movie set for the movie with Greta Garbo, The White Queen. And that iconostas had been taken down and was in pieces in their basement. And I got it, and I had a carpenter in the parish who fixed it up and repaired it. And, uh, now, what is that? This whole, the iconostas. Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. not the icons. The icons were all made for a black and white movie, so <laughs> they were not very good. But so we had temporary ones uh, put in there. But yeah, so that's that's the church. But anyway, um, just a couple of points I want to make in here because I want to get to the other stuff. So I said evangelism may involve individual actions, but a comp communal activity. It must be integrated with the liturgical life. So when I go out there and bless the cemeteries like I did last week, I'll give you a quick example. So I was blessing uh, in the mausoleum there where uh, 
Virginia Page's husband is buried. So I was doing blessing the graves like we did for your family. And there was a man who was there, and he was his. He said, "Father, could you come and pray here? This is my wife. This is my stepson. You know, they died. He was an older man. And he was very shaken." I said, "Of course." And so I, I did the prayers for him right there, and you could just see he was like, like relieved, like there was. Pray- he wanted to offer, do something, and he offered prayers. That was more powerful than any sermon I could ever. That simple act, that it was an act of apostleship. I don't know where God will take it, right? I, I plant, Apollos water, but God gives the increase. Who knows where God will take it? God will take it as he will take it. Doesn't know my name. Doesn't know anything about me. I mean, I introduced myself, Father Eric, but who knows? Who knows? So those type of things are incredibly important. <clears throat> Um, a healthy, local, worshipping parishes live evangelism because it's simply what they do as a Christian. That's it. There's no, I'm going to give you some hints about what that means, but you just simply do it. You simply live it. You simply go out there. And people are attracted to the local parish experience precisely because that is the place where they discover and worship Christ. And while the parishioners must be open to receive and integrate them into the body of Christ. I mean, this is the one of the things I go around to churches and, you know, I've seen the gatekeepers. You know, mm-hmm. you're in my seat. Or, what are you doing here? Or, you know, whatever it may be. <laughs> well, but, very welcome. <laughs> yeah. I guess we didn't look Greek enough. Yeah, you, that, yeah that happened to you. Exactly. Are you Greek? Yeah. What are you doing here? Yeah. Basically? Archbishop Michael tells a story when he was a young priest. <laughs> And an African-American man came looking for the church. And the gatekeeper said, oh, no, you want the Baptist church down the road. He flipped out. Because he was precisely looking for the Orthodox church. This happened to me, too. I've had a couple of people who've done that. I don't think you, you, this is the church you're looking for. It's like, ah, you see fires come out of my eyeballs. That's, that's so crazy. How do you keep Those people really, they, they lost the, the, the Catholic nature. Of the church. Yeah, you know, and sometimes it's done very unconsciously, right? Sometimes a person comes down to the coffee hour and sits by themselves, and no one comes up and talks to them. Hey, how are you? What's your name? Welcome. That's a gatekeeper as well, right? And that's precisely why our job when we come in here, not to overwhelm them. The worst thing you could do is, oh, we have a visitor today. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> I mean, just, just think of that experience of walking, those who walked into the Orthodox Church for the first time. First off, it's a sensory overload, right? We're doing all sorts of weird things. We got some weird music. The priest is throwing stuff at you and smoke is coming up. And, and I don't know what's going on. It's, it's overwhelming. And then you, you, you come and, 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 you know... You're trying to put this all into, into and process this, and then you got people saying, "Oh, would you stand up?" Now, all they want to do is just like, "Okay, let me let me take this all in. Let me figure it out. Let me is this really what I'm thinking?" And by the way, the other thing, and this is incredibly important, a lot of you have read yourself into the faith, right? You already read books, you already kind of got interested in the faith, or you watched YouTube, whatever. And if you see that, and then you walk in and you see something bizarre going on upstairs. You're going to turn around and walk right out. Because it's got to match what, you, what you've been reading. It's not how my personal opinion and how I think things should go. It's the church. And this local parish is the church. The fullness of the church. Not just a little part of it. It's the fullness of the church. There's only one thing I can't do in this church. One thing. I can't ordain anybody. I have to have a bishop. Everything else we do so fullness and evangelism is only possible when the community that evangelizes that church is a radiant manifestation of the Christian faith and exhibits an attractive lifestyle that's why people come, become Christian right? David Bosch is very interesting I'm one of the few orthodox who are a, kind of a fan of David Bosch he was a South African uh, Presbyterian who wrote an incredible book um and he died very early. My, my, my uh, 
one of my professors who, who one of my readers for my doctoral stuff was taught by him. So he, and he has a whole chapter on orthodoxy and he gets it right. He really does. So anyway. Uh, this was my definition for my doctoral dissertation. The witness of the living out of the proclamation of the good news of risen Christ, an invitation to become part of a local orthodox body of Christ through the participation in the sacramental and liturgical life. I just had said basically all that. That's just a precise way to do it. Okay, uh, I'm trying to get through some of this. This is Father Thomas, who was the priest here, and my, my mentor. The one here prior? What? The one here prior to you? No, he was about the second one here. Yeah. The first full time one, I think. Yeah, before Father Alex. Way back. Yeah. He was, on, we were just looking at his signatures on the mortgages and stuff today. Oh, you found it. Yeah, we found it. <laughs> <laughs> so an Orthodox parish that is a local a community of Orthodox Christians with one or more priests has only one, one, one God-given God, God reason for existence. It exists to be the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Christ. Period. Exclamation point. Underline. Bold face. Large type. That's it. Whatever the original reasons or conditions for founding, whatever services and activities it may provide, whatever other desires and needs it may fulfill of the members of the parish, it must be Christ's one holy, holy church. If it is not, then it is neither Christian nor Orthodox. Whatever else it may be or do. That's a bold statement. I wish we listened more to that. That's it. We can have all the wonderful activities and all the wonderful outreach and all that's good. But if it's not being the church, it's not the church. It could be a club. It could be a cult. It could be a lot of things. All right, now we're going to get into some... I did this in Greek because I wanted to sound smart. So. <laughs> Actually, when I was writing, when I was writing my stuff, my, my sister, who has her doctorate as well, she was she was one of my first editors, and she would put these little comments into my manuscript, and I have to remember to catch them before I submitted the manuscript. And one of them is like, if I use a foreign word, that's a plus. If I make up a foreign word, that's a double plus. And if I make up a foreign word that does, that doesn't have any meaning, that's like, you hit the jackpot. So. These all have meanings. So I want to talk about these ways. Again, remember we always think, oh, preaching and teaching, preaching and teaching, preaching and teaching. And I, I argue that there's many ways in which we can be apostles. And all of them may be your gift or your gift or whoever's gift it may be called to do. And so I want to talk about all of these. And that's how we will do the class. So the first one, Kadigma. Now, I, if you go back way, 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 way back in September, I talked about this word. Dogma versus kerygma. You don't remember. That's okay. So a dogma is the teachings of the church that the church believes and that you being in the church understand. Right? I always use the example, right? I explained Pascha and Holy Week, right? Before Pascha and Holy Week. Before all of you. But you didn't understand it until you went through it, did you? Now it makes sense. Now that you were in it, now that you were part of it, now that you were communed, now it makes sense. So, so very often what we believe in the church doesn't quite always make sense in a sense. Well, it makes sense, but it's not understood by us until we actually live it out. Right? Until we actually start to, to understand it in that way. So, part of it is this idea of kerygma is how do we proclaim it? That's the public way. It's not like we have secret knowledge. Like dogma is our secret knowledge. That, you know, you get the special handshake, <laughs> which I forgot to give to you, new catechumens. You, you didn't get the special handshake oh, and, and right. the password, right? <laughs> no. no, it's not like that at all. But it is, you know, there, there's a, a kerygma, a, a public act of proclaiming. The word actually comes from heralding. It means actually... So a herald was someone who would precede the king, right? right? He would go and he would announce, the king's coming, the king's coming, the king's coming. And then the king comes. 
So for us, that, that is our public way in a certain sense. It's the herald. Like, this is the faith. This is the world. This is, this is what we believe as Christians. So for us, sometimes it is that public act of proclaiming or heralding you know, what it is. And that may be our call to go out in public and say, yeah, this is what we believe. Um, we have an article next Wednesday coming out in the Southern Duchess News about the icon visiting. And it was very interesting, the questions that she asked me um, in the article. And she, she quoted Barbara, too. Barbara Ponte. She was, she was all nervous about it. But um, <laughs> she did just fine. So, you know, what, what do I think about miracles? And what do, I, do I believe that this icon does miracles? And I kind of said, well, you're kind of missing the point. It's not whether I believe it or don't believe it. This is the reality that we live. And you can come and see. And you judge for yourself. I'm not here to try to convince you. It's not my job. My job is like here. You know, we have this icon coming, and if people want to pray before it, then come and pray before that icon and let God work it out. That's a short way of saying much longer and more eloquent answer to the questions. But it was interesting that that's where she went on that, on that question, was that type of sort of, and that's okay, that's fine. It's not like, but that was my kerygma, shall we say. This is who we are. This is what we believe. Come and see. Not in your face, not beating you down. You're all going to hell if you're not orthodox. It's not what we do. We're just part of it. So, and again, and this one I constantly remind, one cannot hear what one is not told. Right? If I don't talk to you about Christ, then you're never going to hear about Christ, right? And so... We have to constantly be. Uh, sorry, God. Um, we have to constantly be willing to do that. <coughs> but to be willing to tell those people who may not know, not in an obnoxious, in-your-face way, but in a loving, kind. Come, come and see. Come with us. You're, you're interested in that? I thought I was getting. That was perfect timing, actually. <laughs> and it should always all of this. This public proclaiming should lead to a metonia, a change of heart. That's the ultimate goal, right? We want to change hearts. We want to bring people to Christ. My question for you, and I don't find an answer, why is it important for us to bring people to Christ? You'd be surprised how many people can't answer that. Caruso. <laughs> So again, some of these words, they kind of get a little bit mixed. So that's preaching, basically. Right? So that's primarily one of my jobs. Right? I give my sermon on Sundays. I try to give, I <clears throat> never miss a chance to say a few words. If you probably noticed, you probably roll your eyes. You know? But um, <laughs> you should never miss a chance as a priest, at whatever event, whatever, to give a few words. That was advice that was given to me as a <clears throat> Seminarian, and it's one I give to my seminarians. Never miss a chance because you don't know how that's going to affect someone. You want to know what the most effective evangelism service we have in the church? <clears throat> the funeral. The funeral. There is nothing more powerful than preaching about God when death is right in front of you because you'd be surprised what people think about death. And our church, our service for funeral service is joyful. It's real. It's real. It's it, it's it, it's not going to hide, but it's also joyful and resurrectional. And people never heard that. I, every time we do that, matter of fact, the day of the funeral sermon should always be on the resurrection. And how many people don't even understand that? And they come away like I've never heard any of this. Uh, I will have a whole book I want to do on death as evangelism. I have lots of ideas, not enough time. So never miss an opportunity to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. You know who said that? John, the Baptist. Preaching must feed the flock already in the fold, call to repentance those who stray, and add new sheep to the flock through holy baptism. So every sermon I give, I try to think of that when I prepare that sermon. How am I reaching my people? Who do I know? What is the context? 
Um, what do I feel the message they need to hear? And how does that relate? Because I, the there's a hierarchy. You always start with the gospel and then you work down from there. Um, you know, what about those people who, who strayed away? We have a number of people haven't come back since COVID. Are they watching? Maybe this word will bring them. I don't know. Maybe that word will bring them back. And then we always have visitors and people. So you should always think, who, who am I reaching? Who am I reaching? Who am I reaching? Who's the people? But I want to make sure everyone understands. It's everyone's responsibility. Preach constantly and sometimes use words. I can't quite claim that one. That's, I think it's St. Augustine. But everyone's responsibility. If someone asks you what do you believe, you tell them what you believe. Not in an obnoxious way, but let them know. Preach the gospel. Well, but my one bishop, when I was a young priest, he gave a, you know what the best sermon he ever heard was? It's a sign language. Yeah, it says everything that we need, what we believe. So sometimes we need to do that. Um, anyway, so your actions do speak louder than words as a Christian, by the way. Martyria. So, the Greek word for martyr means witness. How are you a witness? What are you, well, how are you living your life? Are, you, know, you say you're a Christian and you're hanging out at you know, strip bars and <laughs> getting picked up by the police, whatever. Are you living as a Christian? Are you witnessing through your life? When you see someone in need, wait till you hear my sermon on Sunday, um, have you acted like a Christian towards that person? In work, at home, the hardest one is for priests' family to see. You know, the dad's up there preaching the sermon and doing all that stuff, and he comes home, and he's not. You know, you get that from the priest, the kids. Like, yeah, you just preached that in church, and now you're. <laughs> yeah, I know you're right. <laughs> you know, you have to live that life to the best of your ability. That's the witness that we have to give to the world. People want to know what a Christian is, they should think of you and say, that's a good Christian person that I know. So there are two ways of witnessing. I just told you about the passive one, which is very powerful in the church, by the way. There are monasteries which became some of the greatest evangelistic places just by simply being monks, by simply doing the services and praying. There's this wonderful story of, of, did I tell you the story about the two old, the old monk and the young monk? Yeah. I did tell you the story. See, I repeat. Say it again. Well, the old monk goes down, we're going to go preach the gospel to our people. Came down from the monastery, went, shopped, and talked to the people, and then was going back. And the young monk said, well, when are we going to preach the gospel? He said, we just did. We just did. So, you know, people like St. Sergius of Radhanesh and others, great St. Herman of Alaska is a great example. They lived that good, holy life, and people saw that and were attracted to it and wanted to emulate that. But sometimes you are called to be an active martyr, an active witness. You know, you have many, many people. We just, James, right? We just talked about him on, on Sunday. Apostle James, first one to be killed. Stephen, we talked about him being elected. Well, guess what? He got killed for witnessing to Christ. All those martyrs through the Christian persecution, even up until today. Even up until today. You know, recently in Egypt, they just crucified another Coptic priest on the walls of his church. You know, I mean, there, there are, we, we as Orthodox know what it means to suffer. No... Christian faith has suffered more than the Orthodox in the last hundred years. If you want to go back to the Russian Revolution, even up until today. Is that um, just bad luck on Orthodox Christians based on geography? 
I don't believe in bad luck. It's, it's our call. Sometimes God calls us to witness to the truth of his faith. Sometimes, and it's not suicide, by the way. Some people try to say, oh, gee. No, it's just that this happens to be the way in which we happen to be witnessed. So I know what you're saying, like, oh, you know, we had to, we're under the communists or we're under the Muslims or, you know, yeah, exactly. whatever. There, there is no accidents with God. So it happens. And so the real question is, how do we react to it when that moment comes? I have no idea. I hope it never happens to any of us. But when it does, will we stand by our faith? Yeah. I, That's a real down on the discussion. <laughs> it's kind of a testament to the, the truth of orthodoxy almost. Like if you think about the West, right? You know, post schism especially, you know, if you if you recent history, they, there was no Protestant mar it's it's almost, Yes, there were. It's almost unheard of. No, yeah. I mean there was the ones in Oxford who were that who were killed. They still have a cross over the site because they had they read the Bible in English. I mean, so they were burned at the stake. Um, there, so there are a number of, of, of those. I mean, there's many missionaries who went around the world and were killed. Uh, I mean, it doesn't... I, I'm not it, trying to take away from them. I'm saying in a general sense, though. We, we suffered ex, 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 way above the others. And then a lot of the times, if Protestants, you know, like especially during the Reformation time, and, you know, John Calvin or, or any of those guys, they were killing each other. So, a lot, I mean... Yeah. They're killing us, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway. So, what's the whole point of it? Well, it's... And this is the important word, to incarnate a lifestyle. That if you're a witness, this is the way you live. And when you are witnessing someone, you're telling them, this is how to live as a Christian. And sometimes that, that may lead us to this point. I'll tell you a, another brief story. So, Father Prokopi... Pray from every service. Never met him. But my in-laws took care of him. And so he was a uh, priest in Russia during the Russian Revolution. And he was in one village and his wife and daughter were in the other village. And basically the, when the Soviets came into the village they were looking to kill him. And he um, was told not to go back to the village. So he decided that he would flee Russia with and he walked all the way across Siberia, came down through Shanghai, to Harbin, Shanghai, and then ended up in, in New York. And, um, you know, he, he never saw his wife and daughter again, has no idea what ever happened to him, to them. And he was this kindly, beautiful, from all accounts, you know, from my daughter, who my wife who knows, remembers her when she was little, and, and, and just like this incredible story of this kindly man you know, but who suffered greatly. And there are many, many Orthodox priests there. That generation is pretty much gone, but there are still a number of them who suffered horribly. Uh, Father Roman Braga, who recently passed away, who I think one day will be canonized a saint, was in our monastery in, Rome, in uh, Michigan. And, you know, he was tortured so horribly by the communists in Romania, but he just kept coming back and preaching the gospel. And he'd be tortured again, and he'd come back and preach the gospel. And then he'd flee, you know, he'd go to the woods to kind of get away from the crowds, and they would follow him. He's like, I want to get away, I need to get away. You know, even Christ had to get away from every now and then, and they just kept following him. Eventually, he ended up here in America, and he lived, the nuns took care of him, and he was just incredible, just incredible. Like, he'd listen, you sit at his feet, and you'd listen to him, and you're just like, wow, I'm like, unworthy. <laughs> you're up here, I'm down here, sort of person. So, um, but he gives you this hope. You know, that this is the life, and this is the way to be, and this is, they, they just really believe it. They really believe. And we have to really believe and live their way. So, this is what we're doing. Didaskalia. So, it's an instruction, right? So, sometimes you have to teach. You have to teach people. You have to let them know, this is what we believe. This is how we believe it. You know, uh, what is orthodoxy? Correct praise. Orthodoxa, or in Russian, Pravoslavni, correct worship, right? So what we teach and what we say is incredibly important. So the classes that I do, which reach all sorts of people out there, you know, has, has an incredible effect. 
not because of me, but because of God. And so it's incredibly important that we continue to teach and constantly teach and always teach. And I, I, I think, I, I try to always explain. Like if we're doing something, like this is why we're doing this. Or, you know, we're coming up to a specific time in the, in the church here and you'll be noticing this will be happening. So I try to explain why, the, why we do it because there's a logic to it. it. You know, it doesn't come up because I'm doing it, but the church has done this and continues to do this. So, and then, you know, we do the sessions down here. You know, I try to explain to people more about the church and I do individual lessons and all sorts of constantly teaching. And you can all teach. This is what I believe. This is why I believe it. This is what I've learned. There is, um, if you ever have a chance, and you're really, 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 really bored, shouldn't be, but you could be, re Google St. Innocent's Instruction to Missionaries. It is one of the most remarkable documents on contextual theology before there was such a thing as contextual theology. And so what he did was he was explaining to, you know, he, he was the missionary in Alaska as a priest, you know, lost his wife and all, became a bishop, and was instructing his people on how do you go out to the natives and all the people, and how do you be, bring the gospel to them? And it's an incredible set of documents that I follow in what I do here. And just, by the way, the first thing he says, pray. You can't do anything if you don't pray. So if you think you can go and win hearts and minds and, all, and you're not praying, forget it. It's worthless. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He's much more eloquent than I am. But um, he has very practical things. And by the way, one of the things he says, when you're teaching people, don't teach them about fasting and all the other parts of the church discipline and all those things. He said, that'll come. You'll teach them. What's the first thing you teach? What's the first thing I teach? Who is Christ? What is creation? Why is there a fall? Why was there a need for Christ? That's an important thing. Teaching all that, who and what Jesus Christ is and why he's important and what it means and why he had to come into this world. That's what you teach. You teach people about that. And then you start getting into all the other things because they all feed back to that. So get a chance, read it. There, it's, a, it's, a, it's about 50 or 60 different points, but it's really fascinating. Teach the same time, the same place. Right? Always make sure that people know this is the instruction, this is where we're going to have it. I know we're downstairs today, not upstairs, but that's okay. I think it'll be okay. And remember this, you don't teach the church. The church teaches you. You don't change the church. You can't. The church changes you. All of you people I brought into the church, you're different people than when I first met you. The church has, whether you realize it or not, the church has changed you. The church has taught you. The church has led you. I'm just an agent in all of this. So always remember that. Everything we do up there is teaching us. That's why it's so important to hear the words, listen to the words. You know, get to know the service so that it becomes, as C.S. Lewis, like a comfortable, old, comfortable shoe. You know exactly what you're going to get when you put your foot into it. <laughs> so. This is the one everybody wants to do. <clears throat> Apology, apologia. Mm. Apologetics. You want to get into fights. I want to get to arguments. I want to debate people. My God, the internet is full of this stuff and it's all crap. <laughs> oh. It's all crap. <laughs> I look at it sometimes and then I go, why am I wasting my time with these people? Right? Um, but that's not what apologetics is. Certainly it's a defense and we must always defend what we believe. We should not compromise on anything of what we believe. This is what the church teaches. This is what we do as Christians. This is where I stand. Do what you want with me. I can't 
change with the world. I can't change with the whims. I can't change with society. It all comes at us. It always has from the beginning all the way to today, and we are still here. Yeah. Who are all these <coughs> uncrowned figures here in, the, in this icon? What, what? Well, those are the three hierarchs. Okay. And, then, and, and those are... Where did I get that icon? <laughs> <laughs> these are different martyrs, I think. How come they don't have crowns? I think they're all... Because not, they don't have to have crowns in, on an icon. Oh. I think these are all different Serbs. <laughs> Serbs? Yeah. Nice. I think they're all Serbs. I forget where I got that icon. It was so long ago. <laughs> I never even noticed that. I've given this presentation hundreds of times. I never even noticed where that... I can't really? Remember. Yeah, I can't remember where I got that. Anyway. Um, what apologetics needs to be is a dialogue. And I don't mean that in a wimpy way. What does a dialogue mean? It means to split apart. Um. Dialogos. So you need to be able to take this and have the dialogue and take this part and this part. A discussion brings things together. A dialogue takes things apart. Right? And so when we have a dialogue, you never knew that, did you? I didn't either. Don't we have discussions or dialogues these days? In marriage, you have monologues. <laughs> Your wife tells you, <laughs> and you agree. <laughs> but as a dialogue, like we were just doing it before this started, right? Matthew was asking me questions, right? And I was trying to take those questions apart and say, okay, well, let's talk about this part or that part or whatever. Maybe not so eloquently or to the satisfaction of Matthew, but nonetheless, that was part of that dialogue. Ask me, right? You asked me a couple questions before it as well. That's Okay, and this is the answer. Let's take that apart and see what, why it is that we have what we, do, we, we believe. And so when we do apologetics, we have to learn how to dialogue with people. I hear what you're saying, Sam, but this is what we believe, at least my understanding of what the Orthodox believe, and this is why we believe it. So you're a fool. No. <laughs> <laughs> You don't say that part. <laughs> you may think it. <laughs> but no, I mean, that's what, so what, what you, you have to listen to that person, be an active listener, and then you have to turn that around and say, okay, this is what we believe, this is why we, you, you're, you're splitting into the pieces. Yes. So it wouldn't necessarily be inappropriate. What? Well, because if you said... That you're a fool? It wouldn't be ad hominem. <laughs> it would just be, you're a fool. You're, you're not, fool. yeah, you're not. We're all fools for Christ's sake. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, so learn how to do that dialogue. You know, people sometimes complain, oh, you Orthodox, you know, you, why should you speak to other people? Because we should always be willing to speak to other people. Sure. People who don't agree with us. <clears throat> Here, tell me what you believe. Okay, this is what I'm hearing, and this is what we believe. Now, how do you respond to that? That's what apologetics is. Not like, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're talking about, you're all heretics, you're all going to hell. <laughs> I think that. No. <laughs> it shouldn't be in judgment. It needs to be in love. Because if you're thinking that, and this is where the internet gets ugly, because it's all about judgment. It's all about trying to prove my point over your point. Who's the more orthodox? Who's the real orthodox? Who's the really, truly genuine orthodox? And if you don't believe with me, you're an idiot and you're going to hell. I've never seen anything like that. I've seen that all the time. Yeah. You should see the clergy site. The clergy site? Yeah, there's a clergy thing. I don't even, I don't even look at it anymore. I'm so tired of it. Um, Not spiritually profitable. No. Um, but it should never be in a sense of judgment. But it should be in love. How are you going to bring people... Christ, if God is love... <coughs> And Christ is incarnate love. And you're going to bring people to Christ in, a, in an obnoxious way? You're going to bring people to Christ who are angry and telling them they're going to hell? How is that an incarnate love? How are you radiating the love of Christ in that? Sometimes love requires harsh discussion. No, this is wrong. No, this is, and this is why it's wrong. 
but it has to always be with love, with always trying to restore people to their relationship with God. I can't force, like we said, I can't force any of you to believe any of this. You have to come to that decision. Right? What's, what's that quote I gave in the council meeting about Eisenhower? Right? My, one of my favorite quotes. The secret of leadership is to get people to do what you want them to want to do, but they want to do it. Right? I can't yep. force anybody to do anything. I can't force them to come to this church. I can't force them to listen to my sermons. I can't force them to watch my classes. All I can do is just present it. But if you're doing it in an obnoxious way, which unfortunately on the internet many of the Orthodox are doing that in an obnoxious way, then you're proving the point that this is not Christian. Being, yeah, one second. Being a loving Christian doesn't mean being a wimpy Christian, by the way. And that's what most people think. Oh, just let everything go. No. Love requires a strength. And those who are married know this. Right? It requires strength and courage and standing for your faith and standing for your beliefs. and stand But it also means understanding that everyone else, we are all sinners in a way. Yeah? Um, how can one have productive discussions with those who are, uh, say, Roman Catholic? You know, because I've noticed that in some situations, it seems to always spiral into, like, a debate, somewhat some historical about whose faith is truly yeah. orthodox. I don't even bother anymore. I really don't. Because I'm not going to sit there and go, just like with Protestants, I'm not going to sit there and throw Bible verses. And I could do it. I could throw this Bible verse, and they could throw that Bible verse at me, and then you could throw... Where does that lead us to? Except anger and resentment. The same thing with Roman Catholic. You know, people, oh, wow, well, no, the Pope, and then the Pope, and then the, well, who started the schism? And all of a sudden it just gets, like, ridiculous, and everyone is like, ah! Well, we know that. <laughs> so it, it, what profit is that? Present your position. This is what I believe. Accept it or don't accept it. Right? If you want to have an honest discussion, we can have an honest discussion, but don't ever get into this back and forth. I just, I've had it with that. I, I stopped that a long time ago. I, I got so tired of it because I spent most of my time arguing. And how is that helping my soul? <laughs> Nonetheless, how is it helping me be a priest of all of you? Right. So, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, good. <laughs> I'd love to argue, by the way. I'm half Italian. <laughs> Nothing makes me happier. That my father, when we were growing up, my father, would he was an attorney. And he would, at the dinner table, he would love to see us get into arguments. Like, he would throw out an issue and see how we, if we could defend our point. It's the gay issue. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was great. And we'd be, ah, and, we'd, and my father would love it. I loved it. I don't want to do it anymore. It takes requires too much energy. <laughs> Sometimes I go to Thanksgiving and it's like, everyone wants to get into it. I don't want to argue about anything. You know, I'm just so tired. But I loved it. I'm Italian. Let, let's go. I think it's getting done. Yeah. I wish. Yeah. <laughs> Come to a Tassi family event. Okay. <laughs> you'll, you'll see it when the baptism in two weeks when I do my great, great niece. But anyway. Oh, is that going to be here? Yeah. Okay. So, the whole point of the apologetics, by the way, is you can adopt, you try and get this person to understand and adopt a web of beliefs. That's what I've been doing with you guys this whole year. Unconsciously. I'm teaching you to adopt a web of belief. And some of you have accepted it, and I brought you into the church. See? It worked. You were being brainwashed, as some people would say. No. <laughs> it's all about how, how I draw you in. And you, I answer your questions, and, you know, and, and Matthew always challenges me with a good question. That's great. I have a, you're one of, like, five people that I get these, like, out of nowhere, I'm like, okay, i got to think this. This is good. I have to think it through. What am I thinking here? What's the, what's the position? Sure, sometimes I have to really go back and really say, okay, let me research this, because I don't know, which is okay to say. And go back and say, come back and say, okay. That's why I think it's so valuable for seminarians to go into parishes. I mean, Father Alexander got a master's lesson on how to answer questions. Right? You all had a chance to really ask him questions and get him to really think, defend his positions. 
come to, you know, try to get you to adopt a web of belief, shall we say. And uh, he, did, he did pretty well. We already, I already have our next one, by the way. Seminarian? Yeah. When does he come? September. Oh, man, can you, like, accelerate? No, because they, they, in the summer they're doing hospital ministry and prison ministry. And, oh. then, and then when they start the semester, then they come. Gotcha. That's right. Yeah. And they'll be another, another young guy? Yeah. You'll find out. <laughs> Diakonia. What time is it? 8.06. Oh, my gosh. 8.07. Okay. okay. This is the last one. So what does di diakonia mean? To serve. Right? A deacon serves. And so another way in which we become apostles sometimes is by how we serve. Right? To serve others. Actually, there's one more after this. Um, there's that wonderful... So the things that we do in this church, which do in this parish, which are wonderful... We have one coming up, right? The lunchbox. We prepare meals for the for the people, at the, or we have the you know the Christmas fair, and all that money goes to support local charities. Those are important ways to serve. But some of you go and visited. Some have gone to go visit Jackie, who is in very serious condition. That's a way of serving. You know, I I made my rounds last week and did a bunch of people who were shut ins or in the hospitals, and that's a way of serving. Today, we had some women here. They were cleaning the kitchen, cleaning the back rooms. They were scrubbing stuff down. That's a way of serving. Right? All those things that we do is a way of serving. And we should take it very seriously. We have a deacon. And part of his job is to serve. But that's not his only job. Yeah. I hate to side that. But is the seminarian a deacon? Is he a deacon? Or... Yes. There's this wonderful line, Tertullian, who was one of the early church fathers, was not canonized because he got a little wacky near the end. Right. But when people, he, he wrote into a letter, and people were persecuting Christians and stuff, and he, and he quoted someone who said, well, how do we know that this is true? And this was his line, that this pagan said to Tertullian, see how these Christians love one another. Truly, this must be something. So see how we love one another. That's the mark of a Christian community. Do they love one another? You actually want to, not only love, but you actually like one another. I mean, I'm, we're all commanded to love one another. We're not commanded to like one another. But do we love one another? Do we actually live that way? That's incredibly important. And probably what attracted so many people to this parish is the way in which we loved one another. And then John Chrysostom, he always talks about the two altars. He's in one of his sermons. The altar in the church, and the altar in the marketplace. Mm. And we go from the one altar to the other altar, and then back. And so how do we come from this church, and then we go out into the world? How many times do I preach about that? Right? It's crazy, it's chaos, this is the hospital. But you go out in the world, there's another altar there. And how do you serve one another, take care of one another, and do all those things? But what's the purpose of it? To be Christian. It's not there to make people love God, because that's proselytism. This was a big problem in Russia after the fall of communism. Some of these Christian groups were going in, and they were providing food and all this other stuff, and then they were proselytizing them and trying to bring them to their faith. And it's... I remember I was in Moscow, I was on the subway, I was in regular clothes, and there was this American group of Protestant missionaries from down south, young, young people, young teenagers, and they had t-shirts, bringing God to Russia. Oh my. <laughs> like, you realize that the church has been here since like nine, nine what, nine, 33, whatever it was. Um, yeah. A thousand years. Over a thousand years. But you're bringing God now to Russia. Do you know what happened to the people? I, I had to do everything in my power. <laughs> I, think, I think... <clears throat> well, say something. You might what have, would it do? You might have been in your, your rights there. 
like a, like Jesus flipping the tables kind of moment. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do? Traumatize these these young teenagers? Is that what who is wearing the shirt? What? That's what teenagers. Yeah, wearing? a bunch of teenagers. No. No. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Though I did when I was in I was in <laughs> Bethlehem. Example. I was in the cave, you know, where Christ was born, and you know, there's all this stuff. All right. Yeah, and I tell you this story, and then some pro- these Protestants keep that. Oh my God! Oh my God! Disappear! Take my picture and all this other stuff. I was a, I was a deacon then. I was in my cassock. And, Let's sing a Christmas carol and all. And I'm like, uh, finally I said, would you have some dignity? <laughs> and they all looked at me, I'm like, please, this is a holy place. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, you know, I can see it. Uh, <laughs> you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> See it in my mind. Yeah, you can see me doing that. Yeah. <laughs> no, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I can see you both. Yeah, the, the little the, the Bostonian accent you put. Yeah, on exactly. <laughs> no, that was in New York. Oh, that's <laughs> New York. That's New York. <laughs> that's one guy. Homologia. Last one, I promise. So, what does that mean? It's, it's homologia. Same words. Yeah. Okay. Same words. So it's what our profession of our faith is. Do, are we saying the same words? Do we believe the same thing? With one mind, one heart, we may confess, right? We say in the liturgy, right? So when we say that, we're saying the same words. We're saying the same creed. I believe, not we believe. I believe. But we're all saying it together. And that's incredibly important for us. You have to, you know, one of the important parts of the, of the Orthodox faith is I can go anywhere in the, orth, in the Orthodox world and I know exactly what I'm going to get. At least I hope I am. Yeah. One summer I served in Tokyo, Finland, Toronto, and Pittsburgh. <laughs> and this was over <laughs> Spain. <laughs> and I think there was one more in there, I can't remember. And you know what? I was comfortable in every one of those contexts. Oh, England. I was in England, too. I was comfortable in every one of those. I knew exactly what I was getting. And you can't get any more diverse than that, right? (laughs) But nonetheless, we were saying the same words and the same faith. In some cases, the same music, too. The same musical styles. Like, I I know that term. Anyway. So, fight the good faith of, lay hold to the eternal life, which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of so many witnesses. And the back of a priest's cross, not this one, this is a cheapie. But a priest, when a priest gets ordained, he has that silver cross, you know, Father Alexander with the three bar. That's the quote that's on the back of the cross for every new priest. Would you of course, it's usually it? in Slavonic, so you have no idea what it's saying. But oh, so you couldn't read this, maybe? I can't read Slavonic. Okay. I can barely read English. <laughs> <laughs> but that's from one Timothy. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold to the eternal life, which you were also called. Make good the confession in the presence of so many witnesses. That's what we're called to do. That's what our confession means. So that's why we <clears throat> say the creed. What does it mean to be a Christian? What, what, what's in the first classes I do? The creed. Right. right? I be- what do we believe? You're going to be a Christian. You've got to believe this. So when people <coughs> say, oh, I'm a creedless <coughs> confession. Christian, which means you don't believe in anything, because creed means belief. You can believe in anything, and if you don't believe in anything, you can believe in everything. Yeah. You know, I read that all the time, and I can't say that by myself, but when the whole church is saying it, I follow right along. I of course you do. Saying. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. You know, I can't, but I can't, I always mess it up by myself. You know, it's like, oh, it, I it's like the, the liturgy. I, you know, I, I could do it. Probably most of it by memory, but if you ask me to go with this part, but I'm doing it up there, because it's part of that experience. It has to, yeah, in the sequence with everyone there. Yeah, you know. So, I mean, you're, yeah, it's just it's just that's what it means. Be part. And it's not like I'm following. Sometimes I feel on my head of them. Yeah, but it's, I, it's you know weird. it's part it's, of who you are. Yeah, it's it's I, in your very heart and soul yeah. of what you believe. But of course, confession is also another thing, right? It's a sacramental action, right? You come to confession. And it's not like, I confess. Right? Oh, I'm, I'm such a sinner. No. What are you believing? How are you believing? 
Where are we going off track? How do we get back on the right track? That's what it's meant to be, to bring us back into line with what it is that we believe as Orthodox Christians. Because we all fall, and we all need to get up, and we all go off track. But remember, what I say, you have to adopt a web of beliefs, but I'll even add to it, and a web of actions. How do you live? And it has to match with what you say. If I say I'm a Christian, then I better damn well live like a Christian and act like a Christian and speak like a Christian. Otherwise, everything I say is hypocrisy. And I'm guilty of that. (laughs) Come home, get cranky. All right, just leave me alone. I don't want to talk to anybody right now. It happens. We all fall short. Is that a question, Matthew? That was a scratching of the head. All right. And you don't get to see that part. Why not? Because we're done. Next week. Do we continue later? Um, so questions. I presented a lot of information at you but before I get to you. So I want you to think about it. Those are different ways. I just gave you a brief example of seven different ways in which each of us can find that way in which we can be apostles, whether we're witnessing or preaching or heralding or charisma or serving or whatever it may be, that's how we're sent into the world. Yeah. You know, when I, when I before I became, you know, Orthodox, I gave you a life confession and I, I laid it all out there. Right. And you said I should come every month, but I don't really, I'm not a bad person. <laughs> Maybe back then, I'm not There's a bad first person now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one. There's one right there. Right? Yeah. There you are. There you yeah. are. It's, it's not about what you did wrong. Right. I was like, I didn't sin. I don't know what to, you know. It's, it's, again, how are we living our life? How are we falling short? How do we need to think about what we're doing? Right. And it's not as much as I want to hear what you have to say, because I really don't want to hear all your right. your warts and, you know, but I have to. No, I'm just joking. But it's more about, okay, let's, let's reconnect. Let's reconnect with our relationship with God. Are we seeing some ways in which we're, it's going off? How do I get back on track? Am I, I'm doing, I have this issue. Am I seeing it right? Or maybe I'm being misleading to myself. It's all those type of things. I thought maybe I gave it all to you. I should have saved back some. No. No. (laughs) No. All right. Well, thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's my life. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll happen about three more times tonight. I like the ringtone. <laughs> the Ramones? Yeah. You know the story of that? No. So uh, when I was in college, I, my roommates and I worked as roadies for the Ramones for a couple of uh, concerts. We, we knew someone there. They had we need some money, and so we got, we got to work as roadies for the Ramones. It was great. Back in the 80s when, when punk rock was really great in New York and all that fun stuff. So. <laughs> oh, Woodstock? <laughs> nah, Woodstock. <laughs> <not before. laughs> anyway, where were we? Where were we? Questions? Hank might have another question. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking, where, where, uh, there was some place I was going to. Well, you're talking about confession. And yeah, about know. confession, and now I can't remember where I was going to, which is... Probably reason why we need to stop so recording. Let me let me stop the recording and then we can continue talking. Okay, so everyone have a blessed evening and we'll talk. Sorry about that.